elites kind of didn't really want to do, but they would go along with it from time to time. And what we have today is something that is very, very broken. And that needs to be fixed immediately, right now. We are actually very quickly running out of time. We see it in Greece. We're going to see this contagion spread. The rubber has finally met the road. The Lisbon Treaty, the European constitution that further detached the people from the institutions and organs, and, and organs of those that governed them, has already proven to be quite literally bankrupt. Quite literally bankrupt. The one thing I didn't realise during the two campaigns against the Lisbon Treaty was that the chickens would come home to roost quite as quickly as they have. So let me go through the institutional deficit as I see it. Now, please forgive me for you in using PowerPoint because you know the old saying, power corrupts. Well, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> um, but I'm going to use it nevertheless. It actually works, fantastic. So I'm going to run... I'm going to run down these institutions with you here quickly. Now, they're really complicated, and they're supposed to be. You are not supposed to understand how they work. One essential thing to know and understand about these institutions is you are not supposed to understand how they work. As one famous uh, one European Prime Minister famously said about the Lisbon Treaty, he said, it is unreadable, it is a success. <laughs> really, this is the sentiment, this is the sentiment, I don't exaggerate. So, in overview, Brussels' current approach is, and you've heard this already, there is no will in favour of democracy, and therefore the institutions reflect this. You can hardly blame them for that. Member states in the European Union are required to be democracies with governments elected by universal suffrage, so on and so forth. The EU has no such requirement. It is absolutely true to say that if the European Union were to apply for membership in the European Union, it would not meet the entry criteria, not even remotely, because it is not a functioning democracy. <coughs> and people will say, well, it's a supranational body, the UN isn't elected and everything else. Nonsense. This is a body with serious power that affects our everyday lives and is making laws every single day. The institutions are designed for a top-down exercise of power. It's just the wrong design. It needs to be bottom-up. And this deficit poses a fundamental threat to the success of Europe, and it's doing it right now. The European Commission, the first of these institutions, it is the executive. It has the sole right of legal initiative. Not the European Parliament, the European Commission has the sole right of, legal, right of legal initiative. It makes most laws and regulations in every European member state now, the majority. Depending on the country, it can be 80% in one place, you know, 52% in another place, but it makes most laws and regulations. To be able to initiate a law in Europe today, you have to be unelected. You have to be unelected to be able to initiate a law. It decides many laws entirely on its own through delegated legislation. Some not entirely on its own, it has the sole right of initiation and then it decides many on its own through what's called delegated legislation. It is massively abused by lobbyists because think about it. This is the place that the laws and regulations are being initiated from. If you're a lobbyist, as one lobbyist put it to me, he said you are lobbying somebody that never has to face an electorate, ever. If they're not facing an electorate, there's no competition. If there's no competition, the media aren't scrutinising. Who are they having dinner with? Whose boat, did they, whose boat did they spend two weeks on in the Mediterranean? Whose private jet flew them from here to there? Who bought them that nice new BMW, uh, uh, um, so, so on and so forth? This is a petri dish for corruption. The European Commission is entirely filled with people that should be put up for beatification as soon as they die, or 
it is at risk of being seriously corrupted. They're not superhumans. The structure is malformed, it is open to corruption because the people initiating the laws are not ever having to face an electorate and therefore they don't have to consider all of the risks involved uh, and furthermore, to be a lobbyist in Europe, in Brussels, you are not legally required to register. In Washington DC, you are. You have to register as a lobbyist. You can get in big trouble. There is a voluntary registration for, lobby for lobbyists in Brussels, but you don't have to do it. So it's open to abuse. The institutionalized corruption is not a reflection on individual commissioners. There are some very, very fine commissioners in the European Commission, the structure of the institution is not their fault. Commissioners, interestingly, swear an oath to the European Union. So they step away from their countries of origin, from their member states, and their oath and their first loyalty is to the European Union. It's just interesting that they do that. The European Parliament cannot remove an individual commissioner. They can reject the full commission, they cannot elect a new commission to replace it. Now, a, an arrangement of sorts has developed where they make it clear that, look, if you put this person forward, we're going to reject all of you, and therefore a compromise is reached. But structurally, it is not uh, one that's set up to, uh, to, to encourage or support what would be a normal democratic process. The way that business is done is reminiscent of the old people's democracies of Eastern Europe. The Commission has the exclusive right to initiate law, the monopoly of initiative. There is no genuine opposition. There is no vote for those who propose laws. Not even the Prime Ministers of Member States can initiate new laws. There is no clause-by-clause -clause debate on new law. There is no parallel for this absence of democracy anywhere in what we would consider the Western or developed world, with so much power given to the non-elected. Legislative power in Brussels is fundamentally li linked to non-elected bureaucrats. It is institutionalised dysfunction. Most commission decisions are made by its cabinet's director generals, not actually by the commissioners themselves. In fact, largely the commissioners have rings run around them by their cabinets. The commission is now actively anti-democratic, as evidenced by four referenda. The commission is specifically prohibited from interfering in the electoral democratic processes of the member states, and it does this and it does this openly and blatantly. They broke their own law time after time in two referenda in Ireland by advertising, running road shows, uh, putting out propaganda, paying for newspaper supplements, apps sending people into the schools during the election campaign to offer pro-Lisbon treaty arguments even to school children. They've done this four times now. And by the way, and threatened people on the no side. So we've had it in the Netherlands. We've had it in France. This is, by the way, with Lisbon, with the European Constitution. Netherlands voted no, France voted no, Ireland voted no. They made us vote again, and we ended up voting yes. We didn't vote yes because we wanted the Lisbon Treaty. We voted yes because they scared the hell out of the Irish people about all the bad things that would happen to our country if we voted no again. It was an act of surrender. It was not an act of conviction, belief, or support. It was an act of surrender. The idea behind the independence of the Commission was to allow the European bureaucracy control over portfolios. How do we fix this? Well, there is a number of ways, and let me throw out a few suggestions here, because it's one thing to come up here and bang the table and be a, a critic. It's easy to be a critic. How do you fix this stuff? Well, you either either directly elect the commissioners or have parliaments elect the commissioners, national parliaments elect the commissioners, or the commission president is elected by the European Parliament, or merge the council and the commission, which I particularly like, president, 
So you have one president for one term only of, say, six years, given a good stretch so that they can get stuff done, but not long enough that they could do permanent damage. <laughs> or remove the monopoly of initiative from the Commission and make it purely an executive. That can be individually appointed or fired by that elected president. Mm -hmm. Council of Ministers, the next institution. <coughs> it decides laws on the basis of proposals from the European Commission. The problem is neither body, the Council nor the Commission, is equipped for drafting laws and it results in lawmaking being the work of unknown remote bureaucrats with no mandate. Now apart from those of you that actually, it's interesting when you ask an average crowd of Europeans if they can name four people that initiate laws in Europe, you will get stunned silence from the room, even of journalists. It was one of the fun things I did uh, during the campaign. You'd ask a, a, a bunch of journalists, say, name me four people that initiate laws in Europe. And you'd get none. And say, you live in a democracy. They make most of your laws, these people. You can't even name one. You're not reading about them in the newspapers. You don't know why they introduced the law. You don't know. Why does Ireland have 4.5% of the catch of, its, of the fish taken from its own waters and the Faroe Islands have vastly bigger allowance in Irish waters? I mean, just for example, how did that happen? I'm sure it, corruption had nothing to do with it, but, but I mean, there is just one example of another. Every day these things come out. Most Europeans think European EU laws are made by the EU Parliament. It's a fundamental misunderstanding. Welcome to the government of Europe, the real one. Corepair, the Committee of Permanent Representatives. Corepair groups, they even call themselves ministers. They call themselves ministers in Corepair. Each country has one. They meet on average once a day from Monday to Thursday and they decide the majority of European laws. Very few are discussed in the European Council itself. The Union decides about 3,000, roughly 3,000 new laws a year, with only 50 or so that ever make it to a formal vote in the Council meeting. Each minister's vote is weighted by country size. So, for example, the German minister's vote is 20 times more powerful than the Irish minister's vote for example. The only way laws can be blocked is by a qualified majority, which, practically speaking, at the speed that these laws are being passed at, is impossible to exercise. Very, very rarely ever happens. Lisbon Treaty changes, and this is really a European constitution, means that the political elites gain power without the demo corresponding democratic accountability. So it makes it very easy for national politicians to say, oh, the people in Brussels, well, they made us do this. You know, we, we don't like this, but it's Brussels. So we had to do this because it's for the EU thing. And, you know, it's, uh, well, I, uh, personally, I think it's disgusting. <laughs> the European Parliament. Now, I want to preface this by saying there are some excellent MEPs, some in this room. There are some excellent, outstanding courageous MEPs, but they don't have much scope within the structure. They're very creative, they get to exercise individual influence by knowing how this stuff works, but it's much harder for them than it should be because it's not formalised or institutionalised. The Parliament is the weakest of the institutions and it's the most democratic of them, so it's no accident. The most democratic institution in Brussels is the weakest. It's not a real parliament, as we are familiar with the concept. It does not really initiate laws. It does not appoint or control the government of the union. It can propose amendments to laws, but practically only it's supported by left and right, so the blood sport of real competitive politics never takes place. It is bloodless. It is anti-competitive pseudo-politics. That's what goes on in the European Parliament today. The EU legislative power is divided between the Commission and the Council as EU lawmaking is secret. 
Lawmaking takes place in secret meetings, in the secret government, Coropair, of the unelected, acting through their ambassador ministers and their helpers. The EU Council and the EU Commission operating via thousands of secret working groups, about 3,000 it's estimated, makes all of this unacceptable to any right-minded Democrat. The European Parliament continued. The Parliament, frankly, is a dysfunctional, convenient charade with some wonderful talent and good people in it who aren't getting the opportunity to do what they need to do for Europe. The Parliament has no say in anything really important in the execution of power in Europe. How do we fix this? Every EU law should have to be approved by a normal majority in the European Parliament. Every EU law and regulation in existence should be made to be reviewed and re-voted on within the next five to ten years or scrapped. That's a way to put these guys, make these, bu these bureaucrats work. Say, okay, if it's not reviewed and re-voted on, it's deleted. Now, there's, there are more laws in there than anybody knows. In Ireland in 2007, there were 407 laws put onto the Irish statute books, new laws. The average amount of time that each one of those laws was reviewed for was 26 seconds. <laughs> oh my God. They're not even reading them. <clears throat> The Irish Prime Minister and the Irish Commissioner said, with regard to the Lisbon Treaty, and you know, that was being discussed, they said, we didn't read it. <laughs> Sounds like they're close. Can you imagine how they're treating like, The Swedish parliamentarians told me the laws arrive up there on a Friday, I think a Thursday evening, and they're all ratified before everyone leaves on Friday. They're not reading it. So how do we fix this? Approve laws by normal majorities, every regulation should be put under review or automatically deleted. There should be a two for one rule. That is, you want to introduce a new regulation or a new law? Fine, commission. You're sending it down here. Identify two existing regulations or laws that you will delete for every one that we allow to pass through this parliament. Or well, the answer is automatically no. If you don't attach two to be deleted, you don't get one passed. You want to see the regulation and red tape being dropped? That's the way to do it. A half-life rule. Because of the problem that we've identified with respect to lobbying, there's a lot of stuff already on the statute books that we don't need. So any new regulation, let's say it started in a lobbyist's office, do we really need it? Put a half-life on it. In eight years, it, 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 it's um, green, uh, biodegradable lawmaking. In eight years, it disappears. Or 15 years unless it comes up for review and, be voted, and to be voted on. It outlives the lobbyists that way. I'll speed up. The European Court of Justice. Following the Lisbon Treaty, this is now absolutely <coughs> your, for any Europeans in here, this is your Supreme Court. It has clear supremacy over member state laws. It states categorically in the Lisbon Treaty, again, the laws of the Union have primacy over the laws of the Member States. That is already established jurisprudence, but never before did it actually make you a citizen. It is a highly activist court. It is a champion of social change through the law. That's not where social change comes from. It comes from legislators, not from, not from judges. The, this is a court that legislates from the bench. The judges are not required to ha have judicial experience. You don't have to have judged a dancing competition before to be appointed as a judge on the European Court of Justice. Now, there are some fine judges on it, and there are some people who are not fine judges that are on it. Votes of individual judges are unknown. You don't know, so the Supreme Court in the US, you know how a, a judge voted. You don't know how individual judges voted in the ECJ. The court goes well beyond interpreting law, it makes and shapes it, and it urgently needs to be reformed. The other institution, the European Central Bank, one that's rather topical at the moment. This is one institution that we thought was fit for purpose, because we thought we were getting the Bundesbank. Well, we didn't. What we now know is that we didn't get the Bundesbank. Instead, we've got a politically guided central bank that is with its strings being pulled, frankly, by the Commission and by activist uh, politicians and the IMF. 
The independence of the European Central Bank needs to be reasserted today. Literally today. I know this message isn't going to get out there, but if they don't do it today, or if they haven't done it by the end of next week, I seriously think we can kiss the credibility of the Euro goodbye. Wow. Today. They need to do it today. Monetary union and short medium term survival of, of uh, monetary union is now dependent on a political and fiscal union and federalization or the euro is junk. So we now find ourselves in a situation that for Eurosceptics is even more horrifying. If we don't step in now and create true fiscal union straight away, the euro is going to fail because the markets are going to punish the euro for the fact that it is a kind of fake common currency. This is the coin of the realm. The realm is Europe. The realm is too disjointed to support its own coin. So we have to now create the realm. And the problem is, is we don't have the institutions of the realm to allow this to go ahead and be called anything like a democracy. So we're in a really interesting situation. The Commission has hollowed out the European Central Bank. The market risk today is being misallocated to taxpayers. The problem is not credit. I'm sick of hearing it. The problem is insolvency, and it's not being addressed. There are no proper market consequences for profligacy. <coughs> on a member state basis. People presume that they're going to get bailed out and they are getting bailed out. There is a massive distortion of competition which is catastrophic for business and entrepreneurship and innovation and investment. The banking system is not going through the risk re reward purge. We are keeping unfit dinosaurs alive that should be allowed to die where new ones will spring up. The market is now confused on how to price risk and the citizen is being forced into the role of counterparty risk taker for already failed risk. This is disgusting. It's wrong. It's immoral. And we should be outraged. The need is to deleverage. We've got to start deleveraging straight away across Europe financially. More regulation, Mr. Sarkozy, will not get the money back. It's gone. Liberalising bankruptcy laws is actually what we need to do. We need to let bankruptcy do its thing, which is clarify, cleanse, and fertilise the ground for recovery. There is an urgent uh, requirement to liberalise bankruptcy laws. That's what they should be talking about this week. Place risk where it belongs with those that purchased it in the first place. If some German bank or some Irish bank or whatever went out and bought Greek bonds, I wasn't in the room when that deal was done. I'm not a beneficiary. Suck it up. Take the loss. Take 30 cents in the euro. Mm. That's capitalism, and it works. Let it do its thing. This is socialism gone mad. Quick fix. Political and fiscal union, or forget about the euro. The problem with the quick fix, as I said, the other institutions which are as badly structured as they are, and the fact that such a union will not fix the core problem of demographics. Lord Nicholas, the fact that we're aborting ourselves uh, out of existence, the fact that we're not having children, uh, the demographic disaster. Where are the taxpayers going to be that are going to pay for all of this? Where are they in 20 years? Now, who's going to pay for the pensions? Where's the money going to come from? And all these political promises. It's just ridiculous. The money's not there, the piggy bank's empty. And there's no one, we, we, we don't even have new people to put money in the piggy bank. We're kidding ourselves. Wake up. So, the quick fix, political and fiscal union, but that won't get rid of the existing liabilities. We need to fix the bankruptcy laws to do that. I know I'm going over time. Anyone can put their hand up while I sit down and shut up. The institution of citizenship. This is the one that's really under assault. I was trying to think about how to say this because people, and Europeans in particular, 
Americans have a more acute sense of what citizenship is. Now they've got those the, one, the founding fathers, the Declaration of Independence, that sacred constitution of theirs, all of that stuff, all these wonderful words and old-fashioned writing and parchment and stuff. We don't have that. We don't have a good concept of what citizenship means. We think it's a passport and a right to be able to draw dull if you don't have a job. It's more than a passport. It's more than a right to draw benefits. Citizenship, I've tried to come up with a way of picturizing it, of, 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 of visualizing this. And if you think about it as an ark, like the ark of the covenant, think of it as an ark. It's an ark. And it contains your inalienable rights and your duties within a civilized society. Citizenship in a democracy prerequisites justice and equality before the law and government by consent. And folks, we do not have government by consent in the European Union today. And we have to fix that. The Lisbon Treaty reconstituted Europe. It's a constitution. It dissolved the European community legally. It established the Union as a legal entity. It made you Europeans legally its citizens for the first time ever in addition to, not complementary to, your member state citizenship. It asserted its law as supreme over you, so your European citizenship is much more important now than your member state citizenship, because the law that is supreme is European law. National parliaments gave up large areas of power and sovereignty to the Commission, the Council, and the EU court, and just a little bit to the European Parliament in Lisbon. The Parliament in Europe gained token additional rights of legal review and amendment, but they were token rights. National parliaments lost lar large areas of power and the EU parliament's disproportionately small gain equals a deficit for the citizen. The citizen has individual power in his or her arc and lends it to politicians via the ballot box, or that's the way it should work. The politician participates in government with that loaned power. Lisbon means politicians handed over your arc to entities, those institutions, that they can't hold accountable. It made the citizen the subject of a new restrictive citizenship. The citizen can now not get that power back or reallocate it to another politician. The individual arc of citizenship was hollowed out and shrunk <coughs> in this Lisbon constitution. The bureaucracy reduces the value and content of that arc of citizenship by its top-down approach. It's now saying, we're granting you rights in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. We already had those rights. We don't need the Charter of Fundamental Rights to tell us what our rights are. It was in our arc already. What they've done is they've nationalized our inalienable rights, supranationalized them in this case. They have nationalized the arc, taking the arc of citizenship into their control and they're telling you what you can have out of it. And that's not okay. The bureaucracy has made itself do that and this is a challenge to individual freedom. Power in Europe has to be exercised where most appropriate for the citizens. Subsidiarity has got to mean something in the European Union. There are cases where this power and, and responsibility should be exercised at the federal level. Defence, security, foreign policy and other areas. I realise to some people in this room that sounds horrific. Let's be realistic. In a future major conflict, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, on their own, aren't credible power projectors. We're going to have to do it together. Let's bite the bullet on this and let's build the best structures to do this. The power must be loaned to those exercising it, not forever taken from the citizen. If the citizen is not bottom up, if the system's not bottom up, the institutions shouldn't have any power, nor should they even exist. Today, realistically, we are irrevocably citizens of the European Union. So now we've got to fix it. We need touchstones as citizens. The presidents of the EU Council or Commission should be directly elected using weighted voting like the Electoral College. At least make people understand, okay, there's someone we can vote for, and yeah, they're in charge, I'm, I'm now starting to understand this. Citizens need a European politic, even if there's no demos today, and there isn't. The hopefully temporary transfer of power away from the citizen demands a European politic because it's the only way you can get it back. 
<coughs> the institutions as currently established are resistant to a European politics. They don't want it. They don't want the accountability. I won't read this out, but in short, we either do this and we fix it by establishing a European politic with competing political European parties with different ideas, otherwise we are going to be run by NGOs that have no mandate from the people, by pseudo-representative groups and everything else, and we are going to end up in an oligarchy at best, maybe a benevolent dictatorship of some kind, or it could be something less pleasant than that. Don't think it can't happen, because it can, and it's happening under your noses, and we all have to wake up to it. The institution that loses in this situation is the institution and the art of citizenship. How do we fix this? Recognize that the union is necessary, noble, and a good idea, and it deserves to succeed. We need the European <coughs> Union to succeed. Recognize that Europe, and have the ambition, the boldness, the vision, the hope, to think that Europe can lead the world again. Sorry, Mr. London, but I want to lead the world. I want Europe to lead the world. We want, we want Europe, I want lead, European leadership in the world. I want friendly, healthy competition with our brothers and sisters in the United States. But I think Europe can lead. I have the ambition and the chutzpah to believe that it's possible. And we've got to believe it, and right now we don't. But we have to believe it. Europe's capable of a new renaissance. But people have got to start believing that that's something that we can do. Recognize that European government, respective of the member states and citizens, through subsidiarity, is necessary for the future peace, security, and prosperity of Europe, as long as that government is accountable. Challenge the current institutions through the establishment of these European politics with competing ideas, and let democracy do its work. Thank you.